Does set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, mean I don't have to mow the lawn? Let me begin by sharing a personal story from my childhood. I remember this incident like it happened last week. I was about 10 years old. I was standing in the hallway of my home, looking up at my mother. Mom, I said, there are only two jobs I can think of in this life that are worth doing at all being a pastor or a missionary. Now, my mother, who was a devoted Christian woman, was happy to hear this, but why did I make this statement to her? What was going on through my young mind that led me to come to the conclusion that the only two jobs in life worth doing were being a pastor or a missionary? Well, I remember very well why I made the statement. You see, I looked at things this way. This temporal life is very short, and eternity is very long. I also thought the world and everything in it won't last, and therefore it's not really important. Underneath it all was a definite distancing, a disaffection, if you will, or a detachment from this present physical world. Because this world was temporal, therefore, I figured, it was not really important. Because the temporal world is made of matter, which is passing away, it is therefore not of value, either to God or to me, and not worth investing my time in. The only thing that really mattered, I concluded, was letting people know how to get to heaven when they died. Now, don't misunderstand me. Going to heaven is really, really important, and I don't want to minimize that. But as a young person, and even into my early adult years, I had set up in my mind a clear bifurcation of life into two separate compartments, the sacred and the so-called secular. I figured the so-called sacred things of life were of value to God. And in that category, I put things like reading the Bible, praying, going to church, doing evangelism. And the so-called secular things were of no real value at all. In that category, I put things like working as a plumber or a piano tuner, you know, dealing with temporal things that needed fixing over and over, or being a banker or, God forbid, a politician. Because to do these things required a focus on the things of this world or earthly things. And the Bible says very clearly, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So for me, at age 10, there were only two imaginable paths for my future occupation, being a pastor or a missionary. What I did not know is that I had been deeply affected, even as a child, by a way of thinking that was rooted in the ideas of the most famous Greek philosopher of all time, and that's Plato. Now, at the age of 10, I, I don't know if I ever heard of Plato. What's more, I don't recall ever hearing a sermon in which the speaker said the only two jobs in life worth doing were the work of a pastor or a missionary. I just read between the lines. I, I picked it up at church. The declaration I made to my mother that day in the hallway and the ideas behind that statement were more caught than taught. I did not realize it at the time, but I eventually came to realize around the age of 35 that I had been greatly influenced by what some people call Platonic dualism. I had a very bad case of SSD, or the sacred secular divide. If I could put it down on paper, SSD would look something like this. I'll come back to this image a bit later. But before I do, I want to share another incident from my life, which happened about 50 years after I had that conversation with mom in the hallway. I was giving a talk to a group of Christian school teachers and administrators at a conference. And I spontaneously asked a question that I had not planned to ask. What is the purpose of education? And because I had a particular answer in mind, I answered my own question before anyone else could reply. I said, the purpose of education is to equip the next generation to rule well over this material world. Now, following this statement, the silence in the room was so thick, you could cut it with a knife. I just let the silence hang in the air for a moment. And then someone near the front asked, 
Would you mind repeating that? And so I did. The purpose of education is to equip the next generation to rule well over this material world. And then I asked, has anyone ever told you that before? Well, nobody raised their hand. Well, truth be told, I had never heard anyone tell me this before either. I based my statement on the first chapter of Genesis, verse 28. I call this the first commission. Not the great commission, which we read about in Matthew, but the first commission. That's the commission God gave to Adam and Eve at the very beginning of human history. Namely, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and govern over it. This is the commission that clarifies God's job description for human beings. Just 28 verses into the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. And because we have such a clear and unambiguous job description, we have a clear and unambiguous purpose for education, if we connect the two. Simply put, our assignment is to fill the earth and govern over it. And by the way, we are a long way from filling the earth. Some people are now talking about a coming population collapse, but that's another subject. I'd like to focus here on the governing part of the First Commission for just a bit. Let me be quick to qualify the word rule or govern. When we hear such words, we typically think of them in a rather narrow way as political governance. But that is not the only context for ruling or governing over the material world. A child governs over his or her bedroom by making the bed in the morning, vacuuming the carpet once a week, and keeping it neat. When a mother governs over the kitchen, it means having a place for everything and everything in its place and skillfully mixing ingredients. And when an accountant rules over numbers, it means adding them up correctly. When a plumber rules over water pipes, it means putting them together with the right fittings. Adam and Eve were gardeners. They were instructed to tend and keep the garden. This is not to say that governance over planet Earth was the only reason God had in mind for creating human beings, but it's a big enough reason to have been mentioned in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Governing over planet Earth is quite an assignment. It covers a lot of ground, literally. It's an assignment that relates directly to what is taught in school, how it is taught, and more importantly, why it is taught. Education, when it is linked to our very purpose for existence, should equip the next generation to rule well over this material world as God's deputies on assignment. This brings remarkable meaning and purpose to the learning of mathematics, science, language arts, and history. Yet, this purpose for education is rarely mentioned, even among Christian educators. Of course, non-Christian educators wouldn't mention it, and you would expect that, but why wouldn't Christian educators mention it, and mention it frequently? Well, I think there's a reason for that, which goes back to my 10-year-old mind and my declaration to my mother back in the hallway. I'll explain what I mean shortly, but before I do, let me just mention that some people seem to think that God rescinded the First Commission when sin entered the world, but... I don't see this in Scripture. I believe the original job description still stands. It's referenced again in Psalm 8, where we read, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Now these verses are repeated again in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. And then there's Psalm 115, verse 16, which says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. By implication, the First Commission is also embedded within the Great Commission of Matthew 28, where Christ tells his disciples to go into all the world and preach the good news and teach all nations to observe whatever Christ has taught. 
Now, this observation of what Christ has taught doesn't just happen in church or in the home or in one's private devotional life. We have a responsibility before God to govern well over the whole of creation, even in its broken condition. I should say, especially in its broken condition. The purpose of learning, then, is to bring farming, business, law, economics, journalism, art, civil service, plumbing, as well as preaching, into alignment with the Creator for His glory as his deputy representatives on assignment. I said earlier that as a child, I had a bad case of SSD. Well, what do I mean by SSD? Well, in short, SSD sees Christ as relevant to the so-called sacred parts of life, being relevant to what goes on in church or at a Christian school or in one's personal life or witnessing or Bible study, and relevant to one's marriage and the rearing of children, of course, but not really relevant to what goes on in the public square, to what goes on in the workplace, unless one is employed by a church, or in business, economic policy, law, the media, the arts, or civil affairs. These are earthly things, which are mostly a distraction from the things above, things we're not supposed to think much about. I believe many of the problems we are experiencing in the United States these days are due to the detachment and withdrawal of Christians from active, serious engagement in this temporal, material world as followers of Christ, applying our faith to the full spectrum of human endeavor, from plumbing to preaching to politics. But detachment from the so-called earthly things, and notice I said earthly things here, not worldly things, runs counter to responsible governance, or stewardship if you prefer, over planet Earth. Our unique calling as humans is to engage with earthly things according to the will and ways of God, doing His will on Earth as it is in Heaven, being in the world but not of it, occupying planet Earth and ruling over everything in it, including our lawn, as his deputies on assignment. Now, through most of my K-12 years at school, I attended Christian schools, and I'm thankful for that. But I do not remember a single teacher telling me why I was created, or what my job description was, and how what I was learning related in any way to the assignment of governing over planet Earth. Why is that? I think there is a reason, which I will get into shortly. But first, I want to talk a bit about what SSD does to one's worldview and give you a relatively simple way to get rid of SSD. When it comes to reading oneself of SSD, one of the most helpful things I have found is to understand the Platonic roots of SSD, because once you grab hold of the roots, it's a lot easier to pull out the weed. So at this point, I need to get into some basics of Plato's philosophy. Now, I'll try not to get too far into the weeds here because I don't want to lose anyone. I'll try to keep it simple. In Plato's day, roughly 400 years before Christ, in ancient Athens, there were many, many different schools of philosophy. Some Greek philosophers focused on materialism, on getting wealthy and enjoying life while you can. And Plato reacted to the materialism of his day. He focused his attention on non-material ideals, ideals of goodness, justice, truth, and beauty that did not pass away or rot or turn to dust. He tried to find lasting value and significance in the non-material world of ideals of goodness, justice, truth, and beauty, ideals that went on past the coming and going of all material temporal things. The rejection of materialism and striving to get the most toys you can before you die is certainly supported by scripture. But Plato's dualism was a half-truth, and our enemy, Satan, specializes in half-truths. The most effective lies are those that come as close as possible to the truth. And such was the case with Plato's dualism. I think we would all agree that focusing one's attention on goodness, justice, truth, and beauty is far better than focusing one's attention on getting rich. No question about this. The ideals Plato focused upon were unchanging universals, that is, truths that are true for everyone through all time. 
which would give lasting significance to all of the changing particulars in the material world that came and went with the passing of time. But in elevating the eternal realm of ideals, Plato devalued the temporal realm of matter. Plato stressed the value of eternal ideals in contrast to, or in tension with the temporal things of the physical world. And in so doing, he minimized matter. And he sought to remove himself as much as possible from the material world. And this was consistent with a lot of Greeks in Plato's day who looked upon engaging physically with the material world by doing manual labor. They looked down on that. No Greek philosopher worth his salt would aspire to do manual labor. It was beneath them. The slaves in Athens did manual labor, not the citizens. And we can sometimes see a little bit of this tendency, even in Christian schools, that may have a wall devoted to showing what universities their graduates go to, but no wall that shows what trade schools they go to. Trade schools are where young people go to learn how to do manual labor, to be plumbers, electricians, and the like. And the silent implication here is that this is a second-rate path to take. It is significant that in Jesus' day, it was expected that the rabbis would not only know Torah, the law, but they would also have a trade. The famous Rabbi Hillel was a woodcutter, and the equally famous Shammai was a carpenter. Paul, of course, was a tent maker, and Jesus himself was a carpenter. Actually, there's some indication he may have been a stonemason. At any rate, the Hebrews were not ashamed of physical labor. In fact, quite the opposite. It was considered a shame for a father to not teach his son how to work with his hands. The Jewish Talmud says, Just as a man is required to teach his son Torah, the law, so is he required to teach him a trade. It was felt that whoever did not teach his son the law and a trade would bring him up to be a fool and a thief. And we should remember, too, that physical labor itself is not the result of a curse upon mankind. For God instructed Adam to dress and keep the garden prior to the fall in Genesis 2.15. It's also significant to note that the Hebrew word for work and worship is the same word, avodah. All of this was not part of the Greek mindset. Plato split reality into two distinct arenas, an upper level of eternal, non-material ideals, which he called forms, and a lower level of temporal, physical things, which he referred to as matter. He downgraded the body and he elevated the soul. He called the body the prison house of the soul. He and, and other Greeks like him honored artists and philosophers, not plumbers or carpenters. Although there is clearly a distinction between the temporal and the eternal, between the seen and the unseen, between the spiritual and the physical, the Bible does not teach that the temporal physical world of matter is something to be devalued or downgraded or to detach oneself from. On the contrary, the physical creation is something God declared to be inherently good. And we were created to engage with it. Even in its fallen, broken condition, creation is full of God's glory from sea to sky, and he has a purpose for it. The Bible does not teach that the physical world is any less real or less significant than the spiritual world. On the contrary, both the seen and the unseen, the physical as well as the spiritual, are of God, their mutual maker and sustainer. Both the seen and the unseen are real, they're significant, and they share a common unity through God's creating, sustaining power. And because of this unifying factor, we are able to call the universe a universe. God is out to do his will on earth as it is in heaven. We've been instructed to pray to that end. God gets his hands dirty, so to speak, getting involved with what's going on on planet earth. The first commission of Genesis 1.28 is certainly not a call to distance oneself from the physical world, but to responsibly engage with it, to care for it, to steward it. Thus, I repeat, Christian education should equip the next generation to rule well over this material world. With this in mind, let me suggest a rather simple way to get SSD out of one's head. It has to do with thinking a bit differently about reality. It has to do with 
making a quarter turn in the way we see all things. Now let me explain. The sacred secular divide resembles something like a double-decker bus with an upper and a lower level. In the upper area are things like going to church, being a pastor or a missionary, participating in Bible studies, witnessing, going to prayer meetings, singing worship songs, having private or family devotions, volunteering time at the mission or going on a missions trip to Mexico to build an orphanage or, or playing the Lord's Prayer on the piano, etc. And in the lower area are things like Monday through Friday work at the Boeing airplane factory or in an accounting office or building a house that will be sold on the public market or managing a bank or participating in sports or, or playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata on the piano. It is commonly held that a young man or woman who desires to truly serve God in this life will do so by becoming a pastor or missionary. Such work is often referred to as full-time Christian service, while other vocations are simply something less, something less significant, less spiritual. And these things are on a lower level of the double-decker bus. To think this way and to communicate it to others, either by design or by default, through direct comments, or through silent implication, really has been devastating to the effectiveness of Christians in bringing wholeness and health to life in the here and now. If Jesus is Lord of all, and he is, then where exactly is the so-called secular world? Well, here's a short video clip that addresses that very question. The question is not whether some activity is sacred or secular, but whether a particular activity is done in a manner which is in harmony with God or opposed to God. Albert Walters put it this way, Both God and Satan lay claim to the whole of creation. The contrast is not between two realms, but between two regimes. What does this mean? Simply that there are two regimes identified in Scripture. One is called the kingdom of light, and the other is called the kingdom of darkness. Yet there is only one realm of creation. The question is, which of the two regimes will prevail in this realm of creation, light or darkness? Yes, there is only one realm of creation, and this whole realm belongs totally and rightly to God. The devil never created anything. God not only spoke the entire realm of creation into existence in the beginning, but he continues to sustain it in the present, and it all belongs to him. Satan brazenly lays claim to the Lord's creation and seeks to take what God has made and distort or destroy it. But this does not mean the Lord has forfeited ownership, nor abandoned his rights or interest in any part of that which he continues to sustain. Therefore, we must ask ourselves an important question. Is there really a secular realm of life in which God plays no part? Is there any realm of creation that functions on its own? Can God be compartmentalized and relegated to a narrow sphere of life having only to do with religion? Think again. The secular world may exist in the minds of people who have talked about it so long they think it is really there. But where exactly is this place? The real question is, will businessmen operate by godly principles or be swayed by greed? Will medical doctors honor God or dishonor him in their practice? Will our home lives be in line with God's design for relationships? Or will they function by some other authority? Will used car salesmen be trustworthy? Yes, it is just as possible for church work to be done in a way which dishonors God as it is for Monday through Friday business to be done in a way which honors him. One way glorifies the Lord, and the other way does not. Furthermore, any legitimate work done as unto the Lord, in a manner which honors and glorifies him, is an act of worship, and will bring God's light to shine on a particular sphere of his creation. The challenge and call of all believers in Christ is to allow his light to shine throughout the full spectrum of human endeavor and contemporary culture, thus occupying until he comes.
The outcome of SSD can have serious consequences for nations. And to illustrate this, I'd like you to listen to a phone conversation I had a few years back with an African Christian friend of mine who works to establish churches in northern Kenya and southern Ethiopia. Churches in Muslim communities, by the way. He grew up in a Muslim home himself in that area. My friend's accent is pretty thick, so I printed his words out on this video so you can read what he's saying while he speaks. He begins by talking about how the Muslims in his area proselytize through helping people start businesses. And then he shares about the effects of the sacred-secular divide among Christians in his area. When they get into the community, uh, the number one thing is first they study the community and then get a legitimate business that fits in that community. And then uh, they start the business and then use the business to develop relationship or, you know, to develop rapport as an access to the community. And then they develop business uh, partnerships with the locals and, and uh, you can start your own small business without being charged any commission or, you know, getting aid from them. And then uh, eventually you have to be a Muslim to, to receive that. And in cases of Africa where many, are, many people are poor and they don't have anything, you get free help, you get free business to start, but you have to be a Muslim. So many people have been used, uh, they have used those, uh, those uh, strategies to, to sometimes, you know, convert the whole community, the whole village. All right. Can you make some comments on what you've observed amongst Christians and, and their attitude towards business in Africa? Well, maybe a thousand years ago, the priests decided to, to pray, to commit themselves to pray and to read the word and, you know, keep themselves purity from the, the world because they said the business world corrupts. So having that kind of uh, mentality, they decided to, uh, to uh, you know, separate themselves from the whatever they call uh, a corrupt world and you know, resort to prayers and reading and meditations and those things. So uh, evangelicals picked up uh, those kind of uh, teachings and so many of them when they become a Christian they, they quit their job because they said we want to serve the Lord and they don't want to work. I mean, they, they uh, I, I can see, you know, I could see so many evangelists or pastors not working, just carrying their Bibles around and kind of preaching and, and teaching and but you see many of them are as a result of that are poor today they cannot even provide for their own families and the church in Ethiopia or in Africa is so poor that they, they cannot even provide for their needs it's not only that if somebody is called uh, a minister then he also thinks that you are a minister so you should not be working so that's also a challenge The Muslims just don't have a sacred-secular divide, by the way. The Christians in my friend's neck of the woods certainly do. But it's easy to watch this and think, well, things are not that bad over here. Well, I agree. Things are not that bad over here. But I submit to you that we do have a significant enough problem with the sacred-secular divide to work hard at mitigating the problem through distinctly Christian education. We may not have a case of SSD as profound as some Africans might, but SSD is very pervasive among us. And one thing I know for sure, Platonic dualism has pulled the rug out from seeing the purpose and the meaning of education in light of the First Commission. The sacred-secular dichotomy is not biblically legitimate. While the word secular may be used to identify a sphere of life in which God is ignored, it cannot be used to identify a sphere of life in which God is irrelevant. Now, let me show you a different way of looking at things. Rather than a horizontal distinction, where all of reality is divided into upper and lower compartments, in this diagram, we give the circle a quarter turn, so to speak, so the distinction runs vertically rather than horizontally. The vertical distinction signifies that any particular aspect of life may be done in a way that honors God or dishonors him. 
either in harmony with his ways or in conflict with his ways. For example, any legitimate business, whether it's selling used cars or running a bank, can be done in a way that is in harmony with Christ or opposed to Christ. The same is true for art, law, athletics, and Politics in and of itself is not a, a worldly endeavor. It only becomes so when people who practice it do so in a manner which violates or ignores the guidelines of God's word. We cannot say that political activity is a secular endeavor, existing in a contrived compartment of so-called secular life, functioning by its own set of guidelines, independent from God's thoughts on the matter of civil government and human relations. We can, however, say that political activity, which is in harmony with God's word, is good, while political activity, which is in conflict with God's word, is corrupt. Here's the basic idea we're dealing with here. God is relevant to all things under his authority, and since there is nothing which stands outside of his authority, he is as relevant to the way a business functions as he is to the way a local church functions. In short, he is Lord of all, and no less relevant to one area of human endeavor than another, and certainly as relevant to what goes on outside the church as he is to what goes on inside the church. The biblical duality in life, then, if you will, is not between sacred and secular, but between good and evil, no matter in what sphere of life or endeavor it takes place. As we saw in the video, the question is, Will businesses operate by biblical ethics or be swayed by the lure of getting rich? Will our use of medicine honor God or dishonor him? Will our home life be in line with God's design for family or will it operate according to the so-called wisdom of the world? It goes without saying that Christian education can and should play a key role in this process. And this is a big reason why Christian education is so necessary. As we align our ways with God's ways and we equip the next generation to do this well, any legitimate activity of life has the potential to be truly beautiful, good, pleasing to God, and fulfilling. No one has cause to feel insignificant when they are co-working with God. Christian education is the only form of education that aligns with this vision. Why do so many Christ followers struggle with SSD as I did? Well, let me show you another brief video clip that speaks to that question. By the 4th century AD, there existed in the minds of many sincere Christians an unfortunate gulf between the physical world and the spiritual world, and between the temporal realm and the eternal realm. The blending of ideas from Plato with the teachings of the Church led to a religious duality in which the eternal concerns of the soul were set at odds with the temporal concerns of the body. A truly spiritual person was one who was detached from the material world. Vows of poverty and celibacy were marks of a truly spiritual life. The denial of physical pleasures, asceticism, became elevated to a virtue. Abstaining from food, seclusion from society, vows of silence, and sometimes even self-inflicted physical pain went with the territory of the truly devoted believer. Holiness became a matter of detachment from the physical world and retreat or withdrawal from material aspects of this present life. The Apostle Paul prophesied this problem would come about. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, he wrote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. A biblical concept of holiness does not mean a person detaches oneself from the physical world or from any legitimate activities or pleasures to be found within it. It does mean that one lives life in a manner pleasing to the Lord, whether when mopping the kitchen floor or when devoting oneself to prayer. It also means freely partaking of the good things God provides within the borders of his designs. It does not mean we can't eat chocolate, but it does mean controlling our appetites and passions instead of being controlled by them. Of course, this is not to negate the many helpful contributions the early church fathers made 
especially in defense of the faith. But the blending of Plato's philosophy with the teachings of the church early on led to a religious dualism we're still dealing with. Not to the degree many Africans are, but nonetheless, it is a significant problem. And in the early years of the church, the Gnostics taught that salvation was a matter of removing oneself from the world as much as possible, so that some kind of mystical union with God could be attained. Gnosticism was an early heresy which taught that the world and everything in it was created by an evil deity who had rebelled against God. The world itself was an evil prison from which man needed to be rescued. As followers of Christ, we must not view the physical body as a prison house from which to be rescued, but rather as a temple indwelt by God himself. He wants us to employ our bodies for God's purposes in the world while we're still here. And, by the way, our resurrected bodies later in the new earth, by the way. Again, we can say we're not sitting on the top of poles for days without food and we don't live in monasteries, well, most of us don't. And we don't just walk around carrying our Bibles and preaching or teaching. But to what degree Platonic dualism has affected our lives in perhaps more subtle ways? Now, before I conclude, let me make a comment about the verse that says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Well, this verse is Colossians 3.2. But if you look at the context of this verse, taking it from verse 1 to verse 15 in that chapter, you'll discover that what Paul has in mind when he speaks of earthly things is not a reference to your house, your dog, your bank account, or your lawn. When Paul writes, set your mind on things above, the context of the chapter shows he was saying, set your mind on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, love, peace, and thankfulness. And when Paul says, don't set your mind on things on the earth, he's actually saying, don't set your mind on fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, and lies. What's very interesting about Colossians 3 is that in this same chapter, Paul pens some of the most significant words in the New Testament relating directly to labor and the matter of work. He says, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, verse 23. Clearly, Paul was not suggesting that followers of Christ not think about mowing their lawn, just the opposite. Let me leave you with one very practical suggestion for applying this way of thinking to all subjects at all ages in the context of education. I suggest you make it a habit to ask somewhere in your lesson, beginning, middle, or the end, how can understanding this subject make you a better governor over planet Earth? It's a simple thing to do, and you can make a big difference in how your students view the world and their role in it, and how they think about what they are learning and why they are learning it. I recommend Assumptions That Affect Our Lives. While I was serving as a Christian school principal for 14 years, I saw firsthand the vital importance of helping parents, students, and teachers to understand how biblical thought radically differs from the culture around us. This book explains why the culture around us thinks much differently than Christians do and what we can do to help bring about a much needed course correction. Now let me conclude this presentation with excerpts from a telephone conversation I had with Nancy Piercy around 2009. What prompted me to call Dr. Piercy was her 2005 Gold Medallion Award book, Total Truth. Many thanks to Dr. Piercy for granting this interview and for allowing me to record it for the benefit of others, which now includes you. Chief of Staff came up to me and he said, you know, a lot of the Christian young people who come to Washington feel guilty about their interest in politics. Mm. 
And this was a big surprise to me. I didn't know exactly what he meant because I think most of the people around the country think the young people who come to Washington must be very special and very lucky right. to have a chance to be here. And he said, no, they feel guilty. And I asked him what he meant. He said, well, they feel if they were really committed to God, they wouldn't be here. They'd be in the ministry. Many of these young people came from Christian colleges. They've been educated from a Christian perspective, but they still were operating under the sec- sacred secular distinction where working in politics was still part of the secular world and it wasn't as good or wasn't as valuable, wasn't as important to God as working in the ministry. And so what I would, su- I, I would suggest is that most of them don't have a Christian worldview. If you had a Christian worldview, you would understand that you're, you, you would have a sense of vocation, that, that working in politics, uh, working in business, working in education, the arts, science, whatever, that all of these are also ways in which we serve God and we express our worship to God because they're, part, they're, they're ways that we obey the cultural mandate. What do you think is the solution to this problem? Uh, how can we help young people, Christian young people, to uh, keep them feeling guilty going into politics? Well, we have to attack it at the root, and I do think the root is the very idea of a sacred-secular split. Mm-hmm. And we've grown up with the idea that certain things are more spiritual, more pleasing to God than other things. Now, anything that God created is good. What's bad is sin. We are called to separate ourselves from sin, but we are called into every area that God has created. Working in that area is is the way we obey the cultural mandate, which is rooted in Genesis. Right In Genesis, you get God's first job description to the human race when he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. To subdue the earth means to harness the natural resources. So it means all the things that we do that involve some sort of material, whether it's planting crops and um, you know, building bridges, running factories, and even producing music. Right. So subdue the earth means that we are actually called, as part of God's original creation mandate, we are called to work with the, the world that he's created and bring out its, its hidden potentials. <laughs> 